Nice car. What's the retail on one of those? More than you can afford, pal. Ferrari. Smoke. I think there are probably quite a few Ferrari owners who felt called out by this. Being able to afford one doesn't necessarily make you capable of driving one. So with the release of Michael Mann's new Ferrari film, which takes a look at the origin story of Ferrari, seems like a good time to look at some of the more famous on-screen appearances of these cars. My name's Jake Auerbach. I'm a collector car dealer and founding partner at Mort Street Partners. This is The Breakdown. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. 1961 Ferrari 250 GT, California. Fortunately, given what's about to happen, this is a replica uh, used in Ferris Bueller. They made three for the movie, one for show and a couple for go. They actually did a great job getting a lot of these details right. This was the show replica, I believe, which was based on a, a Datsun of all things. There was another replica used in some shots, uh, which I owned briefly, which was based on a Plymouth with a slant six, basically a pickup truck. They get a lot of details right. There were fewer than 100, there were only about 50. The Cal Spider is to a lot of people the Ferrari. This is a covered headlight version, which is a little bit more desirable. So my father loves his car more than life itself. A man with priorities so far out of whack doesn't deserve such a fine automobile. I think this scene is so perfect in distilling down the life cycle of the collector and you, you sort of grow up. If you could sort of imagine, you know, one day to skip school and do anything you want, uh, the thing you would do is drive a Ferrari fast through the streets and take it off jumps. And then by the time you're old enough to maybe afford one, all you want to do is sort of fix it and look at it and never drive it. And it's such a perfect sort of confrontation of those two things. You know, these are really valuable objects. Even at the time this movie was made, they were really valuable. Today, it's quite a bit more valuable. We're talking nine to 18 million a wide range just because there's a lot of different configurations and colors and everything else. I think actually the sort of the main replica sold fairly recently for a few hundred thousand dollars, which is a um, good result for a Datsun. A lot of companies do a great job of getting the visuals somewhat right. To somebody like me, a lot of things jump out quickly, even in this little tight frame. The fender flares, the way that the sort of headlights fit, the buckets, the hood scoop is a little wonky. It's a little stubbier than it should be. The wheels are wrong. The windshield's too thick. Does it matter? You know, we're, we're trying to get something across here. And, they, and I think they do it well. They got the broad strokes of it. I think to anyone looking at this scene, that looks like an expensive Ferrari and sort of mission accomplished. Miami Vice. So the Miami Vice Daytona Spider is one that is a little bit more obviously a replica. And I think it spent a lot of time on screen. There's a few details here that are just totally off. It's a Corvette underneath, a C3 Corvette. And I think that bummed Ferrari out pretty hard. It marks the beginning of them being really protective of the way their cars were used. It's something they continue today, where if you own a Ferrari and want to sort of mess with it, sort of do your own thing to it, customize it visually or in the engine, it's not unusual you get a cease and desist. They treat the silhouettes and the design of their cars as their sort of real patrimony, and they don't want people abusing it. So Ferrari saw the Daytona Spider replica and it doesn't do justice to what a Ferrari is. I think Ferrari stepped in and said, let's, let's get you the real issue. They had this Testarossa. I mean, it was basically an on-screen character. It did a ton for the brand. Today, we all still think of it as sort of the main character in Miami Vice is the, is the car. <laughs> It, do it doesn't sound quite right, if we're being honest here. Probably not the best thing in the world to a cold rev, a flat 12, a uh, box of 12 Ferrari engine out of the box, but that's a real car. And this is an early Testarossa and what we call the Monospecchio or the single mirror or the flying mirror. You can see it has just one side view mirror mounted quite high up on the driver's side. It also has the earlier wheels. It's also white. Uh, cocaine white, if we're talking Miami Vice. I think a lot of people look at the Testarossa as a car that's about 
appearances about flash. This marked the beginning of a really weird period of speculation on Ferrari prices and the prices of new Testarossas, even in the period, skyrocketed to even some people paying close to a million dollars for these towards the end of the 80s in this weird sort of bubble that happened. They've come down now, you can get a Testarossa for $150,000. These are tremendous cars to drive, really fast, they handle well. They're a mid-engine 12-cylinder race car with turn signals, as most Ferraris not just show. Um, quite a bit of go. Magnum PI. This is the way a Ferrari should be driven. Like you're fleeing from uh, attack dogs. I think if you're driving it uh, any less, it's, it's being wasted. This car is, I think, to me, one of the more iconic on-screen appearances. It's also the bane of every red Ferrari owner's existence. If you own any red Ferrari from the 80s, people will go up to you and say, Magnum PI, right? This is sort of the low car on the totem pole. It was the first Ferrari badged mid-engine V8 car. It was an entry-level car. This is full Fiat in effect here. Lots of plastic on it, lots of sort of parts bin stuff. Great cars to drive, truly, but they were meant to be an affordable and approachable entry point. Well, a lot of people think it's uh, flattering, maybe say, Magnum PI, right? It's sort of today a little bit of a knock. Ferraris, red is the color. Rosso Corsa, racing red. It's really tied into the identity of the brand. It actually goes back to a point where racing was really a national sort of pride point, cars were actually painted according to the nationality of the manufacturer. Italy was red, Germany was uh, white and then silver, England was green, so I have British racing green. If you ask Ferrari why cars are red, there's a famous quote that, you know, if you hand a child a box of crayons and tell him to draw a racing car, he'll use the red crayon. Goldeneye. Let's go. It's such a great scene. Hey, I've never tried it, but I think you could do eight sort of pirouettes in a 355. This marks sort of the end of when you could do stuff like that with a Ferrari, in the sense that you go much later into the 360s and 430s, you have a lot of electronic driving aids, electronic steering or brake control, whatever else. These cars had power steering, but by and large, you could sort of switch things off and sort of have an analog experience. This is the TS version, which is sort of a semi-convertible. You can see the top comes off, but you still have those pillars behind you, the sort of flying buttress design. People tend to fall into one camp or another. They either like the full spiders with the full top that sort of folds in, or these TSs. It was the first or well, second generation of Ferraris where you could get paddle shifters, but most of them were still manual transmission cars with an old school shifter right there, three pedals, which is the way a lot of people feel a Ferrari should be. Ferrari. Two objects cannot occupy the same point in space at the same moment in time. The Ferrari movie, it takes on, you know, the early days of Ferrari. It was a racing company which sold cars to subsidize those racing efforts. This was a point in time where road racing was a deadly venture. In the 50s, a lot of road racing was still long distances on public roads. You have Miele, Carrera Panamericana, Targa Florio. These were races where they shut the streets down, they gave the drivers a map and said, Finish there. Mille was sort of the big race, the Mille Mille, a thousand miles. This was an Italian race. There was pride at stake. The movie culminates with the 57 Mille, which was the final uh, iteration of that event. The 315S was the car that was the most advanced Ferrari at the time and the one they ran. The 315 was a continuation of their MM program and the MM stood for Mille Mille. These cars were brutally fast and you know, could, could approach 200 miles per hour. One of the reasons these cars are so beautiful is they hadn't figured out how useful wings were when it came to racing. This is an era we sometimes call sculpted by the wind. It was sort of fluid dynamics that had originally inspired a lot of this sort of, let's think about the wind, realize that it's, a, it's actually an immovable force we need to slice through. Typically cars of this period, once they got to these speeds up, you know, close to 200 miles per hour, they began to lift. 
and get very dicey. That was the limiting factor. But Enzo Ferrari famously felt that aerodynamics were for people who couldn't build engines. He was about power. You know, they began to relent and sort of incorporate aerodynamics and covered headlights in terms of making things more aerodynamic, but still, uh, it held true for them. They thought we needed to build the biggest, most powerful engine. This was also a period of time where there weren't strict regulations on the size of the engine. Ford versus Ferrari. So in this clip, you have Christian Bale in the GT40 and a 330P3 being driven next to him at Le Mans on one of the many long straights that they had there, probably in excess of 200 miles per hour. The 24 Hours of Le Mans is today still really the sort of defining endurance race. It's 24 hours. It used to start with the drivers standing across from their cars. A gun would go off and you'd actually have to run across the track, get in your car and start it and then drive off. But the goal was who can drive the farthest over 24 hours. A lot of teams have said, well, let's just go the fastest. Others said, let's have the biggest fuel tank, you know, so we don't have to be in the pits for as long. The Ford Ferrari film got a lot right about Le Mans, which is to say it's an unusual track in that it's not very difficult to drive it. It's really composed of a lot of long straight roads. You go really fast and you have to take a turn and then you go really fast for a long straight and turn again and you end up in these sort of neck and neck battles at extraordinarily high speeds, uh, where it's about who blinks first and who breaks last. Over 24 hours, how many moments are there like this where the guys are white knuckling it, pushing the pedal all the way down? Probably not as many as the film made it seem. There's a lot of Le Mans racing that's just sort of maintaining your speed, not using too much fuel. You neck and neck, turning your head, checking, you know, Christian Bale sort of turning to the left at 205 miles per hour. Drivers tend to have great peripheral vision and just a general sense of where everyone is without needing to turn. Le Mans. If you want to talk about Le Mans, talk about cars on film, Le Mans is sort of the movie. A little short on dialogue, uh, <laughs> but a lot of great driving shots. And this is a movie where a lot of the real cars were used. They even retrofitted a number of the real cars with cameras. And, and they actually drove during the race. I mean, this was not a staged thing. This was integrated into the Le Mans race in 1970 or 71. This was a really interesting car and in that you begin to see the first stages of heavy aerodynamics, modeling that into the automobile. They made 25 of these. It was the beginning of uh, homologation rules. Homologation is a sort of sanctioning body requires. If you want to race, you have to have a real car that you built 25 of, let's say. So they couldn't just build one insane prototype. They had to actually scale this thing in an effort to sort of keep down some of the wacky sort of over-the-top engineering that went into some of these cars. This was a successful, but now wildly successful car for Ferrari. And it was their first entry back into endurance racing after having lost to Ford and kind of walking away with their tail between their legs. One of the coolest parts of endurance racing, at least as it used to be run, is to see the lengths these teams would go to to keep their cars running. And this is entirely accurate to the way these sort of pit crews approach this. You see them putting on a new nose for one of the cars here. These are Zeus fasteners, which are sort of quick release. So you can take the entire bonnet off in a second and put a new one on and quick release fuel fillers you just saw there, which were featured on some of the Ferrari competition road models where you can sort of bang on it with one hand, the cap flies off and then slam it shut again. National Lampoon's Vacation. I don't know what it was about the Griswold's green station wagon that compelled this to happen, but you know, this kind of sets up the American view of sort of the car hierarchy. The station wagon's kind of always been on the bottom. It still is today a little bit. It's sort of the, you've given up and you have the two seat Italian sports car with no roof on. And it's like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Where did it go wrong? 
this is another example of the, the TS configuration. They never made a full spider of the 308. Some people would know this as the Targa top. That's what Porsche used in their nomenclature. And there was a place to store your convertible top behind the seats when it was not needed. And I think most people drove it with the top off most of the time. Looks a little bit awkward with this sort of outdoor quality vinyl over the top. And especially on bright colored cars, it really breaks up the shape of the car. And this is the classic configuration, red tan Ferrari. Vanilla Sky. Here we see Tom Cruise driving a 250 GTO, pretty undisputably the ultimate Ferrari to own. They made 36 in total. These weren't particularly successful cars in terms of racing. Most of them almost all, well, all of them really went to sort of private customers, but it's as beautiful as it gets when it comes to car design. Those half moon vents we see in the beginning are a really iconic part of this car. They ended up having to change those later, but you can see the sliding windows, the competition fueler on the outside. These were cars that were meant to go racing, but are ultimately actually very usable sort of conventional cars. Another replica, you know, they got a lot right, but wheels, the shields, the chrome, the, the, a lot of details are off on it. Not in a way that's, again, affects things. We get what they're trying to say here. If this was a real car today, it's, you know, approaching $100 million, maybe over $100 million. It is sort of the dream to wake up one day and have the streets of Manhattan to yourself, as well as all the street parking you see on the Upper West Side and those sort of opening shots. I mean, that might, that might be the most uh, sort of fantastical part of it. Tower Heist. Give me that crowbar. This is why we say classic cars are a great investment. They're actually all gold underneath and uh, it's just a good place to put your money. The 250 Lusso, this is one of the first truly comfort production cars that Ferrari ever made. Lusso means luxury. All of the chrome trim around the windows, the bumpers, the playful exhausts that extend out and are polished. These are all things you didn't used to see on Ferraris because they were detriments to performance but there was a growing demand for these cars by the 60s already. You know, Ferrari won so many races, everybody wanted the winning car, but people still wanted something comfortable. So this was plush. When these cars came out, I mean, they even inflation adjusted, they weren't terribly expensive. You didn't necessarily need to be uh, a billionaire to own one. And there's lots of great stories of sort of people who just saved enough to buy their Ferrari. So the Lusso is a car today that's really popular with collectors. They've been refurbished maybe to a standard better than they ever were new, and those will get over a million dollars. Scent of a woman. Al Pacino is driving probably one of the worst Ferraris ever made, but in one of my favorite car scenes, Ferrari scenes uh, in film. They do a great job of setting this car up because they walk into a dealership on Park Avenue trying to take out a Testarossa. They are roundly mocked and said, hey, but for a couple grand, I'll let you drive the Mondial. That's the same way the Mondial is sort of viewed today. It's like, uh, yeah, if you own a box, I'll let you drive this thing. It's a little ungainly awkward convertible top, not very fast. There were a few versions that had sort of an upgraded handling package, which are very cool, um, but these are really cheap cars today. The scene itself is great, watching Al Pacino plays a blind army colonel. Uh, sort of be taught to drive by his caretaker. And it gets into a point later where he has to try and talk himself out of a ticket, which is always a hard thing to do in a Ferrari. You already look guilty, but he manages to get it done without the cop realizing that he's blind and driving through the streets of Brooklyn. I think if you asked the Ferrari world, 99% of the people tell you the Mondial is the one not to own. It's a little too large, a little too heavy, especially from this period of time. I would rather a 328, which, you know, you're gonna be paying three times as much, but I think you're getting three times as much car too. The Fast and the Furious. 
more than you can afford, pal. Ferrari. Smoke. This scene really, uh, I think there are probably quite a few Ferrari owners who felt called out by this. You buy a Ferrari because you, you know, you've made it, you've got enough money to afford one. At some point you realize that being able to afford one doesn't necessarily make you capable of driving one or even mean that it's gonna be faster than a lot of cars, a fraction of the price. It's no secret, you could save a lot of money by buying a Supra at the time. With the money you save, buy a giant turbo, whatever else, and you can outdrag a Ferrari for sure. You know, the truth though is today, these roles would actually be reversed. If you had the on-screen car, this Supra from Fast and Furious, it's worth quite a bit more than the 355. Even if you've got a bone stock sport roof a Supra today with low miles that's been unmodified, it's potentially more valuable than the 355. The Rock. Well, why not? Yeah, the shifting stands out. I mean, it's the classic, you know, car driving in movies is if you want to go faster, you shift which is really not what you want to be doing. You shift when you have to because you've run out of engine. Really, you want to hold it at a higher RPM range, typically. He's also really yanking on it, <laughs> which doesn't help. Uh, there's no need. You want to be quick, but there's no need to sort of really rip it in there. This is a car where you could still get a gated manual transmission. The gearbox has slots for each of the gears to make sure you're going into the right one. It also offers a really satisfying click when you do. You don't hear that in this movie when he shifts, which is sort of a miss, I would think. Oh, why not? This is the full spider here. You can see where the top folds completely into the car. There's no seat pillar that sort of stays up. Nicolas Cage, famous car guy, loves his Ferraris. But yeah, he's really selling that uh, two, three shift right there. Bad Boys 2. We see the guys driving a 550 Marinello. Full disclosure, entirely biased as I'm owner of a 1997 550 Marinello. Here's a case where Ferrari provided real cars taking damage. I wouldn't be surprised if Ferrari cooperated with them to sort of allow this to happen, but these are uh, real 550 Marinellos being driven and this sounds like a 550. These cars mark the beginning of the Montezuma era Ferrari who became the chairman in the 90s and wanted to take Ferrari back to a lot of its roots. This car is a front engine, naturally aspirated, 12 cylinder with three pedals, manual transmission. It really did ascribe to that sort of original Ferrari recipe. And you can see the uh, the shields on the side, the yellow Scudetto. This is something you saw only on Ferrari's racing cars in the 60s with the Cavallino Rampante, the prancing horse on the side. Starting in this era, brilliant marketing move, but you could optionally get these shields as part of your car. It's a little bit more of an old man's Ferrari, I guess, and that, you know, again, front engined, 12 cylinder. And for a lot of people, if it doesn't have 12 cylinders, it's not a Ferrari. I'm not one of those people, but 12 cylinders doesn't hurt. Charlie's Angels, full throttle. Here we've got uh, Demi Moore uh, straight out of the ocean and into her Enzo, which, you know, at the time, this was only a $600,000 car, so I guess you didn't need to worry about drying off first. The Ferrari Enzo is one of the first hyper cars. If you take off all the exterior panels, what you see underneath is basically one of their Formula One cars. This is a very serious piece of kit. Today, they're worth around $3 million, let's call it, some less, some more. Only 400 were made. One was gifted to the Pope. They called it the Enzo, and I think that tells you how seriously they took this car if they were gonna put Enzo Ferrari's name on it. It's funny because Enzo was always against a mid-engine car for the street. Ferrari road cars were traditionally always front engine, so in a lot of ways I'm not sure this is what he would have wanted to see, but in terms of putting forward a sort of technical masterpiece, they managed to skin a Formula One car in a body that would work. Today, this is fully cemented as a collector car, and it's part of the lineage of supercars 
that Ferrari produced, starting with the 280 GTO, it was called, then the F40, F50, the Enzo, and now the LaFerrari. Those are cars that are seen as the Ferrari supercars of each era. 